Okay, so we're talking about sacred time, and we have to start from the very beginning with the creation of time. Time is one of those things that's so close to us, so uh, intimate a part of our experience that we don't oftentimes recognize it as a creation or as something that had to be brought into existence. We just assume that everything runs on time. But of course, we know that's not the case. Uh, there was, so to speak, a time before time. I mean, physicists tell us that time is part of the uh, space, uh, matter, energy matrix. And with uh, Einstein's theories of relativity, we know that there's this relationship between time, space, energy, and movement. They're all interrelated, and they all began at the same time. So, um, you know, Big Bang Theory, which, you know, may or may not be correct, um, but it has some things to recommend it. Uh, but that's the standard cosmology nowadays, and that theory holds that time came into existence along with matter and energy. And so to speak, before the beginning of time, there wasn't any time. And the theologians have been telling this, us this for centuries, that God is outside of time, and to him all things are simultaneous. He lives in timelessness. Well, God creates time in the seven days, and it begins on, actually on the first day, we read in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning one day. And so usually as modern readers, we look at this first day and we think, oh, on the first day of creation, God creates energy or he creates light. You know, we have theories about light as waves and particles and so on. But for the ancients, when they read this, they perceived that as the beginning of the succession of days, which starts the clock of time. Okay, so really what's being established on the first day is really not so much light in a physical sense, but it's time that's coming into being. It's a succession of periods, and that is a novelty. There was no time, so to speak, before the first day of creation. And so once God has created time, then you need to, time needs to be sanctified. Just as God is going to create space in what follows, he creates the uh, the waters above the firmament and the waters below. That's the sea and the sky in day two. Those are the great spaces. And then he creates a habitat on day three. And then he proceeds to fill these areas. And uh, eventually God is going to sanctify space. He's going to create a sacred space, which we call the Garden of Eden. And that's uh, clarified in Genesis chapter 2. But not only space needs to be made holy, but there also has to be time that is set aside as holy. And so when we um, get to the fourth day, which corresponds to the first day, uh, there the realm of time was created with the day and the night, but now we populate the day and the night with beings that will serve for the marking of time. So this is what we read about the fourth day. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. Now, the sacred author, presumably Moses, describes this precisely backwards from how we would think about it. If we're thinking in terms of modern physics and biology, and we, we talk about God created the lights in the heavens, you know, um, lights in the firmament of the heavens, this would be the sun and the moon, we would talk about to give radiation upon the earth so that photosynthesis could take place and we could have growing plants and a food chain, right? That's how we would think, that's the first thing we would think. That's why the sun is there. It's to allow for photosynthesis. But look at what the sacred author says. First thing he mentions is 
for signs and for seasons, for days and years. Signs, othoth in Hebrew, or otot in the modern pronunciation, those are um, heavenly convergences that the ancient Israelites looked for to mark the liturgical seasons. So I did a lot of work in the Dead Sea Scrolls at the University of Notre Dame. There were um, uh, several documents called Otot documents or signs documents from the Dead Sea Scrolls that were these long catalogs of different uh, astronomical uh, phenomena that the Essenes, these Essene monks who lived in a monastery by the shores of the Dead Sea, they would observe the sky and wait for these particular signs to occur and that would help them to uh, calculate the liturgical calendar, okay? And that goes back to very ancient roots of Israelite culture looking for the heavenly signs so you could know when the, when the year began and when the um, liturgical seasons were. And then it says signs and for seasons. And the word for season there uh, is actually moedim in Hebrew, the, the moedim. And a, a moed in Hebrew is a solemnity. It is a, a solemn day. We'll look at this in a moment. In Leviticus 20, 23, there were seven moedim in the um, Israelite liturgical calendar. A moed was a liturgical feast that had the same sanctity as the Sabbath, but was did not necessarily fall on a Sabbath. Um, those seven moedim that fell throughout the year were the first and the seventh day of Passover, and then the day of Pentecost, and, <laughs> excuse me, and then the first day of the year, which is actually, ironically, the first day of the seventh month. That was Rosh Hashanah, okay, the head of the year, and then the Day of Atonement, and then finally the first and eighth day of the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. So that gives you seven Moedim. We would call them as Catholics, solemnities. Okay, and, and you notice the ones on Passover and on uh, Tabernacles basically had like an octave structure just like we often, you know, we observe an octave of Christmas and an octave of Easter with the first and the last days being of the highest solemnity, right? So, so what I'm saying is Genesis 1.14 is using liturgical language. The signs and for seasons, these are liturgical terms for being able to determine the liturgical year and to mark off the sacred seasons. So quite literally, the Bible is telling us that the reason God put the sun, the moon, and the stars up there is to tell us when to go to Mass, okay? And when to observe Easter and all the rest, okay? That's their primary purpose. And, you know, photosynthesis and providing warmth, on the, you know, that, that's a benefit. That's like a side benefit thrown in, you know? But, um, you know, keep the food chain and, you know, the ecosystem and all that. But primarily... So you can figure out when we should go to Mass and when we should observe Easter and all of that. Okay. Signs and seasons for days and years. Let them be lights in the firm of the heavens to give light upon the earth. Oh, yeah. In addition to calculating time. Yeah. Let them give light on the earth. And it was so. And it made the two great lights. Um, the greater light, of course, the sun and the moon. It's interesting that... Uh, they're not even called the sun and the moon. They're just called the, the great light and the little light uh, in Hebrew. And this is, this is a, a kind of a backhanded slap at all the other cultures because what were the sun and the moon for all the other cultures, the Egyptians, and the Mesopotamians, and so on? They were deities, right? And here we don't even use Shemesh or Reach or... Uh, any of these terms for the sun and the moon, we don't give them their proper names because uh, they're so inconsequential compared to the true God, and they're just up there for us to, to, uh, to give us light and to calculate the liturgical calendar. They're not divinities, right? So just the big light and the little light um, for the day and the night. So it, it de-divinizes 
the sun and the moon. And in most of the cultures, the sun was the great god. Like for Egyptian culture, the sun was referred to as Amon Re, and he was the great god. He was the head of the pantheon, and he was the god that held at bay the darkness demon, kind of the Egyptian Satan, and so on. But no, the Bible says he's just the big light. Okay, so that's the, um, the origin of the liturgy is really with the creation of the sun and the moon. And I like a phrase that Dr. Hahn used uh, earlier uh, today in response to my talk. He talked about creation as the curriculum for redemption. I thought that was a beautiful phrase. I never heard him or anybody else say that before. But we're looking at, you know, one of the arguments I made in, in the talk on the fire of the holiness uh, this morning was that, you know, God makes the world with his end goal in mind. He knows uh, what he's going to do. He knows the order of salvation. The new covenant is coming. And even the creation is made in such a way as to anticipate it down to the specifics of the characteristics of fire and water and time and light and all of those things. So we see that on the fourth day. And then um, the first holy day, of course, comes at the end of the sequence of Genesis 2.1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all his work, which he had done in creation. And of course, God doesn't need to rest from work, but he does this uh, just like Jesus didn't need to be baptized, but he does it as an example for us uh, to set a pattern for his, for his creatures who are made in his image. And so there was no sacred day of rest for the Egyptians with their pagan polytheism. And there was no, you know, pattern of six days of labor and a day of rest in Mesopotamian religion either. So the idea of the week really comes from Israelite culture, and the idea of the weekend, again, comes from Israelite culture, and this idea of resting one day in seven, which has a lot of social and biological benefit and seems to really work with the way that we're made. You may know that uh, during the French Revolution, they tried to destroy the week, and they tried to shift from a seven-day pattern of the week to a 10-day pattern, you know, one day off in 10. And that was far too little for the human condition, and it really didn't work. And eventually they reverted to the patterns of nature that are kind of, as it were, written into our biology and, and written into uh, reality, and they had to come back from that. But um, this is kind of the, the, the week is the fundamental unit of the liturgical calendar, and then the seventh day on which you rest and worship, that is uh, the fundamental holy day. But in Israelite revelation, when you rested on that seventh day, you were imitating God. And that was profound, because in Mesopotamian religion, for example, the origin of human beings was as a race of slaves. The Mesopotamians, that would mean like Babylon and modern day Iraq and the cultures that grew up in, in, uh, the, along the Tigris and the Euphrates, those were powerful cultures in the ancient world. And in those cultures, they told a story about how the gods were complaining about having to work too much to make their own food. And so the mother goddess took the corpse of a dead god and used the blood and the flesh to fashion this race of slaves. And that's you and I. And then this race of slaves, human beings, would work the fields to produce grain and raise animals which were brought and then sacrificed to the gods to feed the gods. And that's why we had to sacrifice. We have to sacrifice to keep the gods fed. And if we don't feed the gods, then they get mad at us and they condemn us. So, Think of that kind of worldview, okay? Think of where human beings are in that kind of worldview. But then the Bible says, no, that's not the case. We're actually made in the image of the one God, and we're invited to share with him his weekly rest and just, as it were, hang out with the divinity every seven days 
and just not bother about the rest of you know, the labor, but just enjoy his presence and the presence of his other image bearers, our fellow human beings. And this brings up a profound thing about, the, about what the Bible says about reality. The Bible insists that the personal is before the impersonal and that the subjective is before the objective. This is precisely the reverse of the modern scientific worldview. Modern scientific worldview holds that energy and matter, these objective impersonal realities, you know, electricity, light, and matter, those are the first things. They're, they accidentally are burped into existence for who knows what reason out of the space-time matrix, you know, none of the atheists have an explanation for the Big Bang, um, but it still doesn't it still doesn't persuade them to acknowledge that there's a God. But for some unknown reason, the whole cosmos gets into existence with a big bang and then for senseless reasons just expands. And then after 14 billion years on this little planet, the third rock from the sun, you know, um, uh, water and mud organize themselves into the first amoeba and then it gets more complicated until you have human beings. And then human beings' brains keep growing until all of a sudden, whoop, there you go. And you've got personality, right? And you have thought and love and motivation and all those personal attributes. So those, uh, it really, when you get down to it, uh, the, the secular scientists think that all those personal attributes like thought, will, affection, uh, desire, love, all those things they believe are illusions created by the complicated matter in our brains. But really, we're just robots without any of those things. And we just think that we're thinking and we think that we're loving and, and all of that. So what they do, and this is what's taught in the schools, and this is what's taught in the STEM academies, and that's what's taught in our universities, is that the, immater the uh, matter and the uh, impersonal is primary and then persons come along very late in the game as the accidental unintended byproduct of evolution and that's completely wrong on every level okay even scientifically especially scientifically because it's contrary to the principle of entropy which is well documented and i want to go and take my course on religion and science anyway um, but what the Bible says is, no, in the beginning, God, and God is a person. God is a subject. He has a personality. He has thought, love, affection, desire, goals. And before anything material is created, there is God. And then God speaks because he is an agent, and he calls the world into existence. So the personal is before the impersonal. And the personal calls the impersonal into existence, okay? And what we are made for is interpersonal communion. I can't emphasize this enough. This is radically different from Darwin. This is radically different from Marx and from all of, uh, you know, from Nietzsche and all of the thinkers whose ideas are still poisoning world culture. All those guys got it precisely wrong. They, uh, you know, because they start off from an atheistic premise, but we human beings are made for interpersonal communion. We're made to be with God and be with each other and enjoy each other's presence. That is our purpose. That's our goal. And that's what heaven is going to be like. Amen. You know, interpersonal communion, that gaze of love, we call it the beatific vision. Why do we call it the beatific vision and not the beatific conversation? Well, because after about a million years of being up there, we're going to get everything worked out and there won't be much else to say. But there will still be love. And just like an old couple that understands each other very well and doesn't need to say a whole lot because they just have this understanding, they'll still sit on the park bench and watch the sunset and look into each other's eyes. Because after 50 years, they still love each other very deeply, even though everything's been said. Amen? And that's a foretaste of the beatific vision. That's why we call it the beatific vision. We'll just be in that gaze of love with God. That, that's, that's an expression for the intimacy of communion forever. And a foretaste of it is the Sabbath. The Sabbath was when you stopped your work 
You kicked back, you relaxed, and you worshipped, and you just opened yourself to God, and you just experienced his creation, and you experienced his presence, and you experienced the presence of the other image bearers. And you'd think that a command to relax would be well-received by human beings. Can you think of a, a less taxing thing to be told to do? I want you to take a vacation. I want you not to work. I want you to relax and kick back. But you know, the whole history of God's people has been rebelling against this command. You know, like, no, no, I got to work. I got to work. <laughs> Come on. <coughs> Could there be an easier command? I want you to do nothing. Okay. But, you know, we rebel against all of God's commands, even, even those that are so obviously for our good and they're so obviously enjoyable to carry out. And so we always try to find ways to, to work and to clutter up, clutter up the day of the Lord and the other feast days in the liturgical calendar with different activities that distract from entering into communion with God. You know, think about when, you know, when people in love want to be together, they take measures to get alone and to get quiet, you know, so they go to a quiet restaurant, you know, maybe with the lights dark, you know, a candle on the table, and they eat together where it provides some solitude, you know, and, and uh, parents, you know, they want to share time with one another, lock the door, you know, and turn off their phones, you know, and, and share time with one another away from the kids, etc. So the Sabbath is like that with us and God. It's like stop the work, stop the noise, create this sanctuary in time in which you can be open to God and enjoy interpersonal communion with God, where you have time for prayer, where you have time for worship, Prayer and worship are ways that we commune, that we, uh, you know, communicate with God and experience him. And we think, again, you know, that we would just be overjoyed with this command, but because of our fallen nature, we find ways to resist it. Well, this is the seventh day. So the, um, all of creation is made according to a kind of basic liturgical time. It's made, of course, to, uh, it's made according to the basic unit of the liturgical year, which is the week. We've seen how uh, day and night begin the cycles of time and how the heaven, heavenly bodies are placed there to, to calculate uh, sacred time and how the Sabbath is that fundamental sacred uh, day. And then when we get into the creation of Adam and Eve, um, we see many beautiful things that point to the sacredness of time and the sacredness of the human body. Um, in, in verse 18, it says, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Really, I shall make a help complementary to him, is how I would translate the Hebrew there. It's a beautiful Hebrew word, konegdo, which probably is closest to the English idea of complementary. And... Um, uh, and, and this, I, this idea, it's not a helper, it's, a, it's just a help, is what the text says. I'll make a help complementary to him. That's the literal Hebrew there. And the word for help, azer, in the Bible, never refers to the help provided by a servant or a subservient person or a slave or a child. This word help always refers to divine assistance or to assistance that comes from a king. Uh, many of the uses of this word are actually in the book of Kings when one king would send an army as a help to another king. So it's, it's help that comes from above. And we see, uh, we see the structure of matrimony here because, you know, in matrimony, we're channels of grace. And what is grace? It is help that comes from God. And so we as spouses are called to be channels of God's help, of God's grace towards one another, and that was the original purpose behind the creation of Eve, of the original bride. And so God teaches Adam what he needs, 
makes Adam go through experience so Adam can come to know something about himself. And, and what God does is he brings all the beasts and the birds, etc., to Adam. And Adam looks through them all and realizes that none of them are suitable or complementary to him. And once Adam has an idea about what he really needs, then the Lord God causes a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took out one of his ribs. And this is an, an, an interesting word in Hebrew. This word rib, selah in Hebrew, which means rib or side, it's used 40 times in the Old Testament, and except for one instance, 39 out of those 40 times is in the context of a sacred place of worship. Okay? So uh, twice here with reference to Adam's body, and then um, 37 more times distributed among the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness, the building of the temple under Solomon in 1 Kings 6 through 8, and Ezekiel's eschatological temple in Ezekiel 40 through 48. That's the only other three places where this term selah is used in the Bible. So is that just accidental that we're using a term from temple architecture to describe Adam's body? Not at all. Adam's body was a temple. It was already a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then this sacred um, uh, building uh, unit from his side is, is taken out, and it's literally, literally built into a woman. This is the RSV translation, says made into a woman, but the Hebrew word is bana, which is built. And why is the woman built? Because she too is a temple made from this sacred beam that's taken out of the side of the temple body of Adam. So they're both uh, temple bodies of the Holy Spirit, we might say. And then Adam is put into a deep sleep for this to take place, for the surgery to take place. You know, God is the original anesthesiologist, okay? I'm going to put this over your face, Adam. I'm just going to take, okay, breathe deeply, okay? Um, and uh, so he goes into his sleep, and that's on the sixth day. And then he wakes up, and the woman's brought to him. This would be presumably then on the seventh day, which is the holy day. And then he cries out, This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You know, so he bursts into song. He, he becomes the bard. You know, up until this point, he's been hanging around with the apes, tossing bananas back and forth and checking out his opposable thumb. And then all of a sudden, a woman shows up. He's like, oh, I got to clean up here. You know, and now iambic pentameter is flowing out of his mouth, you know, and he's the bard, you know. And it's the first lyric poetry in the Bible. He's all impressed with the woman. He's trying to impress her and um, with his artistic uh, qualities. And, uh, but it really marks this as, as a high point. And so on the seventh day, this day of rest and worship, the sacred day, the first man and the first wife are brought together and they enter into communion on that sacred day. And it's pointing to the sacredness of marriage and how marriage is an icon of the communion between God and humanity, which is intended for the sacred day. Okay, for the Sabbath. And so, like I said, we are intended for interpersonal communion. Communion with God on the Sabbath, communion with our spouse through matrimony, which is a sign of our communion with our fellow image bearers. And uh, so it's, it's very beautiful. Now, let's move on uh, much farther along in sacred history, and let's look at the liturgical calendar that Moses instituted uh, much later after God revealed himself and made the covenant at Mount Sinai. So in the aftermath of Sinai, um, for about one year that they tarry at the mountain, Moses went up and he got a, additional commands from the Lord, uh, commands that allowed him to set up a, a uh, religion, to set up a liturgy and a liturgical calendar. And so Leviticus 23, the Lord said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, the appointed feasts of the Lord, that's the Moedim, I would say the solemnities. And I've got an article that came out last year in the Catholic Biblical Quarterly on the meaning of this term Moedim. And um, in, in Greek, 
it becomes uh, uh, the the great day or great uh, a great day is a moed in in Greek at a certain stage in in uh, Jewish Hellenistic culture and so on. So anyway, it's it's technical. I don't want to get lost in the weeds of that, but um, I would say these appointed feasts. I would refer to these as solemnities. That's that's what they would be for us of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. That's when you'd have a when you would gather together for communal prayer and worship. That was called a holy convocation. You shall do no work. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. My appointed feasts are these. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. So the week with the Sabbath as a seventh day, this is the fundamental unit of the liturgical calendar. And then apart from the week and the Sabbath, there are seven other Moedim in the course of the year. And these are them. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations you sh which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, which was Nisan, which fell in spring, like around April, okay, uh, on the 14th day of the month, in the evening, it's the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work, but you shall present an offering by, the fi by fire to the Lord seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. Now, there's a little bit of a debate, you know, how do we understand the 14th day and the 15th day? And, you know, uh, are these, this, you know, the same as this, this is the Passover day, what's being referred to here? But we don't need to get into that. It suffices that you basically have a week-long feast of the Passover, and the first and last days are solemnities, okay, Moedim. And what's involved here in this, in this observance is both uh, a natural rhythm as well as a redemptive rhythm. So this um, feast of Passover, uh, on the one hand, it celebrated the cycles of creation or the cycles of nature because this falling uh, in the month of Nisan, this was the beginning of the barley harvest, okay? And barley was the grain that ripened first of the different grains like millet, and um, sorghum and oats and so on, all the different grains. Well, barley ripens first. So when the first barley came in, that would coincide with Passover. And so Passover celebrated, you know, God's provision through nature and part of the sacred natural cycles because the cycles of nature were a kind of primordial liturgy. But it, the Passover also celebrated an event in salvation history, or we might say redemptive history. And that, of course, was the beginning of the exodus from Egypt, where God extended his hand to draw his people out of slavery and to bring them to uh, the holy mountain. And as long as we're talking about that and the exodus, let me point out that the book of Exodus is a very liturgical book. And there's a literary theme in the book of Exodus that at the beginning of the book of Exodus, they are laboring for Pharaoh. They're doing slave labor for Pharaoh. And the word for their labor for Pharaoh is avodah. But you see, in Hebrew, the word avodah can also be the word for worship. And so at the beginning of Exodus, they are performing avodah for Pharaoh, which means slave labor for the king of Egypt. But by the end of the book of Exodus, the tabernacle has been built and God's presence comes down and inhabits the tabernacle, and now they are performing avodah for the Lord, which means worship. So they've moved from work to worship, from labor to liturgy, and that says something about God's intentions for his people. We work, we work now, we labor in this temporal reality, but we're heading towards the eternal liturgy where it is all going to be uh, worship. But getting back to this now, that was how the Passover was structured. So the Passover, it commemorated a, something in the natural cycle, 
an aspect of creation, the cycles of creation, and it also commemorated something in salvation history, the exodus and being freed from Egypt. Well, let's go on and uh, look at what else uh, we have in the um, liturgical calendar. So uh, the Lord says to Moses, um, on the day after uh, the Sabbath, uh, presumably following Passover, uh, this would be a, um, a Sunday, in fact, then you are to take a sheaf of your grain of the first fruits. This would presumably be barley, which ripened first, and you're supposed to bring this sheaf and wave it before the Lord as kind of a symbolic offering. And then once you wave the grain before the Lord and offer the other sacrifices, you, being, you begin counting. And you count out seven full weeks, it says in Leviticus 23. That's a total of 49 days. And then on the 50th day, after seven full weeks from Passover, that becomes uh, what we know of as the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost in, in, uh, uh, in ancient Israel was just called the Feast of Weeks. And as I mentioned in my talk this morning, this 50-day uh, period marked the extent of the grain harvest, and by the end of those 50 days, all the different kinds of grain had ripened and it had been brought in. The wheat was the last, and after 50 days, you were bringing in the last of the wheat. So the Feast of Weeks celebrated part of the cycles of nature. It was like a Thanksgiving festival when you bring in uh, the final part of the harvest in the late fall. Because it didn't fall in late fall. It, fall, it fell in summer, actually, for ancient Israel because their agricultural season is different than North America. But it was, you know, giving thanks to God for his great provision. But then, as I mentioned this morning, uh, this Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, also commemorated the giving of the law at Sinai and the forming of the Sinai Covenant in Exodus 20 through 24, that was uh, 50 days after the first Passover, if you count carefully in the Pentateuch. So again, we're celebrating the cycles of creation and also the events of salvation history or of redemption. And um, we go on from that in, in the, um, that the day of Pentecost was a holy convocation. It was a solemnity. But interestingly, it wasn't observed as an octave. You didn't have the a week-long celebration with the seventh day also being a solemnity uh, for the Feast of Weeks. And then in the seventh month, which fell usually around September uh, in the fall, this is when you brought in the grape harvest. This is when the vineyards were ripe and you harvested all the grapes and made the wine. And so that's the, the seventh month was the month of the grape harvest and we get some different solemnities there. So the first day of the seventh month was New Year's Day. Go figure, we would think it should be the first day of the first month, but actually the head of the year, or Rosh Hashanah, was on the first day of the seventh month. And um, why is that? Well, probably something to do with the sacredness of the number seven, and those of you that hung around, have hung around with my writings and, and Dr. Hahn's writings in these conferences, you know, Seven is the number also of what? Covenant, right? It's the covenant number. Because in Hebrew, when you would form a covenant, you would swear an oath. And oath swearing in Hebrew is literally to seven oneself. Okay? And as the Israelites looked upon it, God made an oath and formed a covenant with all creation in Genesis chapter 1 because the seven days were a divine sevening himself. God was sevening himself through the seven days. That means to swear an oath in Hebrew. And so the seven days of creation are, a, are a, an enacted, unenacted oath that establishes a covenant between God and all creation, which is subsequently renewed at various points in salvation history. But on the seventh month, which is sacred, it's the month of covenant. It's the month of the grave harvest. On the first day, you shall observe a day of solemn rest. It's a solemnity with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. This is the head of the year. Shall do no labor, laborious work. 
Um, and then on the 10th day of the seventh month, that's the day of atonement. And again, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall afflict yourselves, it says in Leviticus 23, 27. That means you shall fast. So there was only one day of fasting in the Mosaic liturgy, and that was the Day of Atonement. And then um, later in that month, on the 15th day of the seventh month, and for seven days, it is the Feast of Booths, also called the Feast of Tabernacles. And the first day was a solemnity, and the eighth day was a solemnity. So a little bit different than Passover, which had the first and the seventh days as solemnities. And he would celebrate for, the week, for a week. And if you read down further, what, it, what uh, Moses commands the people to do is, built, is to build shacks using branches and leaves and so on to build these shacks or like lean-tos or temporary shelters to live in during the seven days of the Feast of Booths. Because the Feast of Booths celebrated not only the grape harvest, and let me explain that. When, you know, before, before refrigeration and other means of preserving fruit and vegetables, when your vegetables or your food was ripe, okay, in this case, when the grapes ripened, you had to get them off of the vine and turn them into wine immediately because if you let them stay for a couple days longer, what was going to happen? Okay? They were going to rot. Okay, Things did not stay good for very long. And so when you, if you had a cucumber patch, when your cucumbers were ripe, you had to harvest them all immediately and get them pickled before they would rot. And if you had a grape vineyard, you had to get those grapes. As soon as they hit the peak of ripeness, you had to get them off the vine, crush them and make wine before they began to rot. So there was a, almost a kind of panic about getting the harvest in. And so what happened in ancient Israel is when you were getting close to harvest time, they would watch carefully. And when they realized this is the time, the grapes taste right for, you know, for making wine, they're at the peak of ripeness, it was all hands on deck. It was a full court press to get those grapes off and to crush them and to get them uh, you know, to start fermenting to be good wine, which is a form where their, where their nutrition would be useful to you and be, would be preserved for you for the rest of the year. You know, fermenting and making wine was a way of preserving that nutritious grape juice. And so they would do that. And since they were in such a rush, they wouldn't even go back home to their, to their houses at night or their caves or wherever they lived. They would stay in the field and they would build a shack in the middle of the field, in the middle of the vineyard, if it was the grape harvest, and they would sleep in a shack where they would basically collapse when it finally became too dark to do any work, but they would stay right there in the field so that as soon as it got light enough to get back to harvesting the grapes, they could wake up at, you know, 445 or whatever with the first crack of light where it's just getting gray and get out there and get back to harvesting the grapes. So these booths that are being talked about in Leviticus 23, this was connected to the cycles of nature, to the natural cycles of creation, but also tied to redemption, tied to salvation history, because during the Exodus, God came down and dwelt in a tent, a temporary dwelling that was like a sorry shack compared to his heavenly mansion. And so just as God dwelt in that temporary tent while they were in the Exodus. So for seven days in the Feast of Booze, the people of Israel would dwell in these temporary um, lean-tos, as it were, these temporary shelters, and it would celebrate the fact that God had come down and tabernacled with them. And that feast was the culmination of the liturgical calendar and you will read about the Feast of Booze or the Feast of Tabernacles in 
John chapter 7, where Jesus goes up to, uh, goes up to Jerusalem during this feast. Interestingly, on the eighth day of the feast, the, the, la the final solemnity, that's when the Jews later in their history would begin to pray for rain. And there in John 7, it says that Jesus got up on that last day, the day when they began to pray for rain. And he said, if anyone thirsts, uh, let him come to me and let him drink who believes in me. As the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. So in the context, you understand Jesus is claiming to be divine. Because on the day when the Jews began to ask God for water, Jesus gets up and says, if you're thirsty, come to me, okay? And that really implies I am God. So there's a lot going on there, and the, the Gospel of John especially uh, picks up themes from the liturgical calendar of Israel. So what we've seen is there are three great feasts uh, that later on we find out God commanded all the men of Israel to come to the, to the sanctuary for the three great feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and booze. And we've seen how each of these uh, sacred feasts celebrated both the cycles of nature as well as um, the uh, events of salvation history. So let's talk now about, you know, how do, how, do these, how do the realities celebrated in the Mosaic Liturgy, how do they transfer into the Liturgy of the New Covenant? Well, the first feast that is outlined in the Old Testament Liturgy is the Feast of Passover, of course. And it's easy to see what the equivalent of Passover is in the Liturgy of the New Covenant, that translates into Easter and Holy Week, okay? And to a certain extent, the octave of Easter celebrated for eight days with the first and the last being a solemnity. So Easter is the Passover of the New Covenant where the Eucharist, the Passover meal for the New Covenant is established, etc. And so we can, um, we can recognize that and uh, Easter Likewise, uh, just as uh, Passover does, um, celebrates the cycles of nature. This is the beginning, if you're in Israel, it's the beginning of the, um, the grain harvest in North America. It's the beginning of the planting season where it's finally warm enough that you can go out and begin agriculture. A new life is springing up and uh, the, uh, the soil is coming back to life after the winter. And so you have that, as well as Christ coming back to life, rising from the dead, a symbol of our own resurrection, that one day we will be planted in the ground and we will spring up and be resurrected to eternal life. So this connection with nature or with creation, as well as redemption, is also present in the liturgy of the new covenant. Well, secondly, we have the Feast of Weeks, where you count seven weeks uh, and then on the day after, which is the 50th day, then you have that uh, Feast of Weeks. And that's an easy one to see as well. That's the Feast of Pentecost. Okay, and we talked about this in the Fire of God's Holiness in the earlier talk. So just as Pentecost celebrated the end of the harvest, when you're bringing in the wheat, so um, that's the cycle of nature, and it celebrated the giving of the law at Sinai. Pentecost for us celebrates the giving of the Holy Spirit, which is the new law of the new covenant. That's the event in salvation history it commemorates. And it also celebrates the harvest of the Gentiles. The Israelites were the first fruits. The Israelites are like barley that ripens first. And so the first uh, fruits of the church are Jewish from the people of Israel. And then we enter into the harvest of the Gentiles who come later, the end of the harvest, who are like the wheat. And so um, you have that connection both to uh, the natural order as well as uh, commemorating salvation history. And then the final great pilgrimage feast of um, the Liturgy of Moses was the Feast of Tabernacles, okay, where you would bring in the grapes and begin to make the wine 
and pray for rain, etc. Uh, according to the rabbis, this was the greatest of the um, the greatest of the feasts that were celebrated in Jerusalem. And what is what is the equivalent of this in the calendar of the new covenant? Well, the equivalent is our feast when we celebrate God coming down and tabernacling among us. And that is the feast of the incarnation, where God takes on, as it were, a, a temporary dwelling. He takes on human flesh, mortal human flesh, and he dwells in mortal human flesh amongst us um, and even refers to his body as a temple. John 2, 21, he spoke of the temple of his body. But that famous verse in John 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 14, actually in the Greek, a more accurate translation would be the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, using the Greek word for tent or tabernacle, and alluding to the Feast of Tabernacles. So just as the Feast of Tabernacles was the great temple feast where in the time of Jesus, the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated God dwelling in the tabernacle, the temporary structure in the wilderness, and it also celebrated the successor of the tabernacle, which was Solomon's temple, and it also celebrated the temple that God was going to bring at the end of time, those three aspects of the Feast of Tabernacles in Jesus' day, okay? So the Feast of Christmas celebrates God coming down in human flesh and dwelling within us, dwelling amongst us, uh, to accompany us in a journey out of the slavery of sin to the freedom of worship as children of God. So there's that tabernacle Christmas uh, connection here uh, with the liturgy of the New Covenant. And Christmas, in the wisdom of Holy Mother Church, also recognizes uh, the natural cycles. So falling as it does uh, near the uh, winter solstice, uh, it is the time of the year where the light begins to increase. And so we celebrate the light of the world, as he is described in John chapter 1, coming into the world as a little child and then growing and increasing until his light uh, fills the whole world. So we see this pattern both in the, in the liturgy of the Old Covenant and the liturgy of the New, that we celebrate the cycles of creation, which are kind of a curriculum of redemption, that God set up this cosmos in such a way for the purpose of worship, all right? And Adam and Eve were the first priest and priestess in the garden, which was the first sanctuary, <laughs> etc. And that's our calling. We're called to be a priestly people. Our status as priests and kings, like Adam and Eve, is restored to us by baptism. And we're a people of liturgy that... Just as Adam's gardening in the Garden of Eden was actually also his worship, his work was his worship. This is what we learn to do as Christians through the power of the Holy Spirit. We learn to convert our labor into a liturgy, our work into worship. And we do that by doing our work with excellence, doing it with the right intention, seeking to sanctify our work, sanctifying ourselves through doing our work, and sanctify others through our work. This is that's from Saint, the triple sanctification of work from Saint Jose Maria. Sanctify your work. That's like do your work in a holy fashion with excellence and with the right intention. And then seek to become holy through your labor. And then seek to work for the holiness of others through the product of your labor. That's the triple sanctification, and that's the way that we uh, recover um, that aboriginal priesthood of Adam in our own lives, and we make our lives a kind of living, continual uh, liturgy. So this is how sacred time was, was set up in the Old Covenant. And now, through, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, sacred time is also set up in our liturgy today. But comes back to the purpose for which we are created, and that is interpersonal communion. Ultimately, communion with God 
God's personhood is reflected in the personhood of other human beings, but his is the ultimate personhood. Uh, this is why we, like in, um, in solemn benediction, we praise God for all his attributes, but we also praise him in his angels and in his saints. And that's an idea going back all the way to St. Augustine and even earlier, that in heaven we will enjoy God and we will also enjoy God's presence in the angels and in the saints. And so when we're spending time with fellow saints and with the angels for eternity in heaven, in a very deep way, what we're enjoying in our fellow believers and in the angels is really God's presence in them and the way that God's nature is reflected in, in particular ways in the uniqueness of each individual angel and each individual human being who's sanctified and purified in, um, in heaven forever. And so practically speaking, what does this mean for us? Uh, we need to recapture the idea of liturgical living. Okay, too often in the modern, especially American Catholic lifestyle, uh, the cycles of the liturgy are a kind of afterthought with the exception of the biggies, you know, Christmas and Easter. So we're cognizant of those. Those kind of scream at us, and the, and the church gives us whole penitential seasons to get ready for them with Advent and Lent. But we don't always do a good job, do we, of observing the rest of the cycles and the feast days and the solemnities. But these should be really big things, okay? Some of the feast days of the saints used to be huge in Catholic European culture, and we've gotten way away from that. Take John the Baptist, for example. His feast day is on June 25th. It's halfway between Christmases. John is the moon to Jesus' son. Just as Jesus' birthday is celebrated when the sun begins to grow uh, and the days begin to grow longer uh, in the depth of winter, so John's feast day is celebrated when the sun begins to grow less, when the day begins to shrink. And that's because John famously said, he must become greater and I must become less. So on the day, when, on the, the day of the year when the day begins to grow less, roughly the summer solstice, right? That's when we celebrate John the Baptist's feast day. And that used to be a big thing with bonfires and celebrations and so on, in, uh, especially in Northern Europe, and we hardly even remember it. We may go to mass on the day, oh, hey, what do you know? It's the feast day of John the Baptist. Just found that out because, you know, I'm a daily communicant anyway, you know? And, you know, so we don't really live into the liturgical calendar. So we need to live into the liturgical calendar because quite literally the purpose of time is to create the condition of possibility for us to enter into communion with God and with others. And we need to also recover the beauty of sacred rest. And, uh, you know, as Dr. Hahn was emphasizing, the beauty of now the Christian Sabbath. So we no longer observe the Sabbath on the seventh day, but because the first day of the week is the day that Christ uh, uh, rose from the dead, we have shifted that, that sacred day one day forward, despite the objections of the Seventh-day Adventists who really resent this. But anyway, uh, we, since early time, and you can see it already in sacred scripture, how the first day of the week what is important in the Gospels and in Acts and and elsewhere, the book of Revelation, for example, John sees the whole vision of Revelation on the first day of the week when he's uh, in, 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 in prayer and worshiping. So we need to keep the new Sabbath, um, which is Sunday, we need to keep it holy. You know, this is one of the most neglected of the Ten Commandments. We think of the Ten Commandments, okay, don't murder, okay, check. Don't commit adultery, okay, check. Uh, don't... Uh, uh, you know, don't bear false, oh, I usually don't lie, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, we go through them, but we forget one of the Ten Commandments, which is eternal moral law, is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, which for us means the first day of the week. And so again, we need to avoid the distractions, the distractions of labor, the workaholism. Um, uh, rabbi Joshua Abraham Heschel, very famous rabbi, um, I mean, it was Abraham Joshua. Anyway, uh, founder of one of the main branches of modern, uh, modern Judaism, used to say that the Sabbath was created so that man could rest and acknowledge that the world was already made. 
Okay. We don't have to always be remaking the world. It has been created. So on the Sabbath day, we rest and we acknowledge, hey, God did his work. It's here. It's beautiful. It's good. I'm going to enjoy it. Okay. So abstaining from shopping. Okay. This is why in America, 50 years ago, shops were closed on the Sabbath day. Why is that? So you're not making people work. On the Sabbath, you're allowing all the people in retail, okay, also to rest. Gotten way away from that, haven't we? You know, and uh, making the day focused on worship, about attending Mass, and not just, you know, attending a vigil to get it over with so that we can have all of Sunday to, I don't know, fish or whatever, okay? But really using Sunday for what it was intended for, which is to worship, and then for sharing time with uh, with family and with other believers entering into that interpersonal communion. And, you know, also things like prayer and meditation on scripture, a, a, day, of, a, a day of quiet, a day devoted over to um, being open to God's presence and entering more deeply into communion with him. This is really the reason for the entire liturgy is to facilitate communion with God. Well, that's been a little overview Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great wisdom to work with our bodies and to work with the cycles of creation, to give us this great, uh, this great treasure, which is the liturgical year, built on the precedence that you established with Moses and your Old Testament covenant people. Lord, help us to live into the liturgy and to... Uh, actually use these days of holiness that are set aside, these great solemnities that we have through the year, actually for prayer and worship and for a little more time and quiet and for a little more time in adoration and um, for spending that time with you and being open so that you can come down, as it were, into our hearts and walk with us in the cool of the day, even as you communed with Adam and Eve in that fashion. Uh, Lord, help us to really take the, the precautions and the measures that we need to in order to keep that sacred time safe, to shut off phones and electronics and to close out the distractions and be able to focus on you and also focus on one another, uh, your image bearers who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask this through Christ our Lord in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. And we've reached that most unusual of circumstances where I've actually run out of things to say. So we have Q&A. We've got about 10 minutes left scheduled until 3.15. And so um, we'll make it available if there are some questions. If there aren't any questions, we'll just go, I don't know, go get a snack or something. But if anybody has any questions, about anything that we've talked about in the conference. Yes, sir. Yes, there is something in the Bible that says about when humans were allowed to eat meat. And it's in Genesis, the end of Genesis 8 and the beginning of Genesis 9. It's the Noahic covenant, the covenant of Noah. And so there's a parallel between the covenant with Adam in the garden and the covenant with Noah after the flood. A lot of parallelism there. So Adam and Noah are parallel. They're both priest fathers over all humanity. And uh, with Adam, you've got the garden. And with uh, Noah, you've got a floating garden, which we call the ark. And you've got Mount Eden for Adam. You've got Mount Ararat for Noah. Um, and so in Genesis, at the end of Genesis 8, the beginning of Genesis 9, God renews the covenant that he originally formed with Adam um, with Noah but unfortunately, because of the entrance of sin into the world, things are not as perfect as they were in the garden. And in the garden, it's very explicit in Genesis 1 that every, every living thing was to eat the green plants and to eat the fruit with the seed in it. So everybody was vegan uh, in the garden. And that's where you get the images of um, they, they will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. So that image of the peaceable mountain of God from Isaiah 11, 6 through 9, that's actually taken from the description of Eden where all the animals were at peace with one another, there wasn't carnivorous activity, and the green plants were given for food. But now in the covenant with Noah, it's, it, it, it's 
the covenant is renewed. God says, I make a covenant with you. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, repeating those covenantal commands that were originally given to Adam. So we're, we are renewing it. But now, however, uh, God says to Noah, now the fear of you will fall upon all the animals and you can, uh, you can kill and eat the animals. So that's the beginning of bratwurst, okay? It's uh, Genesis chapter 9. And thanks be to God, right? Because uh, where would we be without brats? Um, yes, yes, sir. Yeah, so that gets us way far afield. Um, but I think that uh, part of the issue is what is time, how, what is time really before there are any um, created observers, you know? And this, you, when you get into quantum physics, you find out that certain kind of physical uh, processes require observers even to take place. So there must have been a consciousness present but not a temporal consciousness, it would have been a divine consciousness before the creation of human beings. And so, you know, when, we, when we're talking about creation, before the creation of Adam and Eve, uh, when we're talking about days and so on, you know, what is the passage of time when you don't have any created observers? What is the meaning of that? And what would that even have been like? And I think that pursuing that might end up giving us an answer to, you know, the, the apparent ages that we see when we look out over the cosmos, versus the way that it's described in, um, in Genesis from a human perspective. In fact, there is, a, uh, there is a, an Israeli rabbi and physicist named uh, Gerald Schroeder who works out a careful accommodation between, um, you know, uh, as it were, divine days uh, based on uh, the theory of relativity and from being at the observational perspective of uh, the center of the Big Bang uh, versus uh, the passage of time from the perspective of a, of a temporal observer who's on the Earth. And he gets a nice match between the, uh, the age of the Earth and, uh, and, and a week from the perspective of a human observer. Anyway, I, c I can't go into all of that. But the, the historical critical method, uh, that gets as far afield. The historical meth critical method is, is um, composed of four sub-methods which are described as text criticism, okay, um, source criticism, form criticism, and redaction criticism. And actually the historical critical method is a little bit misnamed because the history doesn't per se enter into any of those. All of those are actually forms of literary criticism. So I would prefer that it be called the literary critical method and none of those methods really directly addresses how do we you know, calculate uh, or how do we understand the passage of time and creation you know, from, from what we're told by the creation story and, and science. The, the historical critical method does not offer a solution to the accommodation of uh, revelation and um, the information that comes to us through the methods of natural science. So I would say that. And uh, there's a lot of other things I would say like that. Every two years I teach a course on religion and science uh, here at Franciscan, and we, and we go over different possible uh, ways of understanding Genesis. So we look at, say, literal six-day young earth creationists, both Protestants and Catholics, representatives of that position. We look at day-age theorists. We look at intelligent design theorists, old earth creationists, theistic evolutionists. We look at, we look at all of those. But the church is not dogmatic about that. Um, the best document on that question that's authoritative that's come from the church is Humanae Generis from Pius XII in 1950, who establishes some basic parameters that we have to hold to for the preservation of Christian doctrine. That is, for example, that there was a historical Adam and Eve who are the parents of the whole human race who are created in a state of justice and had a historical fall into sin that breached their covenant with God. Those are non-negotiables. Those have to be held to preserve the integrity of Catholic dogma. But beyond that, in terms of timing and the possible precursors of the human body and so on, 
Uh, Pius XII allowed uh, discussion of that. He urged that it be frank and balanced and so on, but, uh, but he left that. So that's the current state. At some point, the church may add further definition and say, no, you know, certain views of creation are out of bounds or are incompatible with the Christian faith, just as further definition was given to, say, Marian dogmas, you know, in the course of church history. So if it becomes necessary to do so, we may come to a point where we have an ecumenical council defining more specifically what Catholics must believe about, say, the days of creation. But we're not at that point. Um, so um, I try not to be more dogmatic than the church on that issue. Yeah. Okay, yes, ma'am. If there's a microphone there. Yeah. Okay. I have two questions. Thank you for the talk. It was really great. Um, one is, can you recommend any resources, either by you or both and other authors, to develop your team? Could you move a little closer to the mic? I can't hear what. My first quick question is, can you recommend any resources that develop your topics from the previous talk? But my question about this talk is, um, I'm a, I'm a scientist, I should say that there are a lot of Big Bang proponents that are physicists out there that are not, uh, when time was created, it's just independent of that. So like both things can be true in this truth cannot contradict truth spirit. So in that spirit, um, is, is there anything in the original language of Genesis 1-1 that would prevent us from interpreting Genesis 1-1 as the creation of space-time and the rest of creation deriving from there? Yes, uh, no, in fact, I think that, in fact, that is the, the interpretation I favor when it says, in the beginning, I, I think that's talking about an absolute beginning, you know, and God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth is a Hebrew way of referring to the totality of that which exists, you know, the cosmos, okay? So I think it's referring to the cosmos being called into being out of nothing. Um, there is, you know, creatio ex nihilo. And uh, it was, a, you know, one of the reasons why Big Bang Theory was opposed even by, say, Einstein, you know, because it, it started with uh, Father Georges Lemaitre, who had what he called the cosmic egg theory. He had this idea of the universe coming into existence and expanding like an egg growing. Um, cosmic egg didn't catch off as a, it didn't take off as a term, but... One of the critics of the theory called it a stupid Big Bang idea. And then the Big Bang, that was, that was Fred Hoyle who came up with Big Bang. He didn't like it. He was the last holdout for steady state theory. And, uh, but, but he unwittingly gave the name to the theory. You know, but it was an embarrassment because this idea that the universe came into being in time sounded like Christian theology. It sounded like creatio ex nihilo. And it raised awkward questions like, well, what was before it that could cause it, you know, and there's strong theistic implications of the Big Bang because you have, um, you have a, an effect that requires a cause. So what caused the Big Bang? Well, since the Big Bang is the origin of all time, matter, and energy, its cause can't be anything that's time, matter, and energy. It's got to be something that's outside of that. It's got to be like an immaterial, timeless cause, right? And it also has to be a highly intelligent cause because you look at the fine tuning of the universe and how all the cosmic parameters are kind of like on a knife's edge to allow the universe to be life supporting. And you have this extremely low entropy, like ridiculously low, that's where you get the Penrose number, right? And uh, so it's ridiculously improbable that, a, that such a highly ordered universe would just come into being uh, from nothing. And so it bespeaks some kind of super intelligence and so you have a super intelligent, massively powerful, immaterial, and timeless cause. <laughs> well, what could that be, you know? And so there's strong, you know, and so um, strong theistic implications. And uh, when I was a kid, Robert Jastrow came out with this book, God and the Astronomers. And I read it when I was like 12, and it powerfully impressed me. And he pointed out that, you know, the, the whole Big Bang Theory, uh, which some regard as like anti-Christian or something like that, but it's not actually, it was actually resisted because it, it really lent credence to the idea that there is a God. And it still does when you think about it. So um, 
I don't know if that answers your question, but I think your, the first question you asked was, are there further resources on what I was discussing this morning? And I, I regret to say I'm not aware yet of, of this. You know, the, the, the theme of fire and the relationship of, of God's holiness to fire is actually not something that's been explored a lot in, um, in biblical theology. But, it, you know, I was just working on it for the sake of this conference and starting to get into this. And as so often happens, when you t- take an aspect of sacred scripture or a divine revelation and kind of enter into the storyline from that door, you start discovering, oh my gosh, there's so much there that I didn't, it's like Alice through the looking glass, it becomes bigger and bigger as you go further and further in, and you you, you begin to realize this is much bigger than I realized, you know? So actually I was talking with Dr. Hahn earlier today about maybe working, working this into a book and, you know, trying to you know, find secondary literature on this and so on, but it's, it's really uh, fascinating, so thank you. Thank you. For the question, great. And we are out of time, so I wanna thank you very much for coming to the conference.